component of the 2DCC webinar series. I'm Kevin Dresso, the Operations Manager for the 2DCC. Today we have Dr. Lu Chao Lu from MIT. He is the Robert Shulman Career Development Assistant Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Um, Dr. Lu Chao Lu is a user of the 2DCC, and a lot of what you see today will be a little bit about that user project and, and all the other research that he has done. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lu Chao Lu. Uh, thank you, Kevin, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, so uh, uh, I uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to present our recent results. Uh, so today I will mostly talk about electrical uh, induced magnetic switching with two special materials. One is compensated ferry magnet, and the other is top insulator. So part of the work that I will uh, present today is done through collaboration between my group at MIT and Professor Nitin Sama's group at Penn State. And some of the materials that we utilize in those uh, studies is supported through the 2DCC program. Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, briefly mention about the motivation for us to look into uh, spintronic devices. It's because nowadays people are extensively studying beyond CMOS technologies. Uh, one difficulty or one problem with existing CMOS technology is that uh, the power consumption is simply too high. So for example, if we uh, talk about the uh, most fundamental building block for uh, existing semiconductor technology, that is a field effect transistor, you will see that the power consumption uh, within each of the uh, switching of those, those devices is proportional to the CV square. Basically, C is the capacitance stored in the channel, and V is the supplied voltage. Uh, of course, if you talk about the power, then you need to multiply the uh, operating frequency. Nowadays, this is two or three gigahertz for our uh, regular uh, laptop or desktops. Uh, so although each of the transistors only consume very small amount of power, but if you put billions of transistors together and then form uh, some supercomputer, for example, you will find that power consumption is extremely large. Uh, for example, each year there will be a rank of the uh, supercomputers with the largest capacity, fastest speed you will find that actually even a few years ago, uh, the power consumption is already above, uh, let's say more than 10 megawatts. So I think uh, last year it was already 30 megawatts. Uh, so this is a amount of power that will be produced by a mid-sized nuclear power plant. So that's quite a lot, lot of power. If you convert this into an uh, electricity bill, you'll find that uh, one of the supercomputer will consume more than one sorry, $10 million per year, just electricity. Uh, so that's probably one of the reasons that we uh, regular people cannot afford to have a supercomputer at home. Um, so in order to overcome this kind of difficulty, uh, so people are looking to many uh, different technologies. And one type of device that people are interested in is this kind of spin-based device. Uh, so in this kind of spin-based device, basically instead of moving charge into and out of the uh, channel. Uh, so basically the information operation is basically realized uh, through this uh, flipping of the spin. So in principle, this kind of flipping of the spin, uh, electron spin can be much more energy efficient compared with moving it around. So that's the reason why uh, we are interested in studying spin tonic devices. However, if you look at existing uh, devices, spin-based devices, and ask how do they perform compared with existing uh, transistors, existing CMOS technologies, you'll find that actually they are not good at all. They are not better at all. Uh, if you talk about the power consumption during uh, switching from one bit, uh, if you compare uh, transistors versus magnetic switching, for example, in a typical MTG structure, you'll find that uh, for current technology node, which is about 20 or 30 nanometer, uh, for each of the transistor, uh, for switching one bit, you only consume around 0.1 femtojoule. So that's very small amount of power, uh, energy, sorry. But if you look at the magnetic switching for a standard MTG, normally they still consume about a few picojoule to sub picojoule. So there are a few orders magnitude uh, gap between the magnetic device and the best uh, transistor device. Um, at the same time, if you look at uh, another um, metrics for uh, characterizing the performance, that is speed, you will find that spintronic device, uh, 
they mostly operate around the time scale of nanosecond or even a few few nanosecond or 10 nanosecond. However, uh, our existing uh, transistors actually they can work at much lower speed. For example, uh, tens of picosecond or even uh, a few picosecond. So this again, in terms of the speed performance, there is also a huge gap. So uh, well, basically the simple uh, conclusion is currently the spin charting device or the magnetic device is no way better than existing uh, semiconductor de based devices. So uh, the question is, what's, what causes this? Uh, is it due to some fundamental limit? If it is due to, funda due to some fundamental reasons, then we probably should give up. And there is no hope to get even better device performance. But if it's not, then probably there are uh, some uh, uh, possible approaches for us to uh, overcome these difficulties. So first of all, let's get a rough estimate on the fundamental limit on the energy, cons energy consumption and speed performance of uh, magnetic devices or spin-based devices and compare it with existing uh, transistors. So first of all, uh, it's about energy consumption. So uh, the minimum energy consumption for a spin charting device is actually given by this thermal stability. Uh, so basically we know we want the device to work at room temperature. If you want it to work at room temperature, then the device has to have some energy barrier which overcome uh, the thermally induced uh, agitation. So generally people talk about this 10 years rotation. So that means if you put the spin, put the magnetic device in one state, it will not flip into the other state just due to thermal uh, effect uh, within 10 years time scale. So that usually corresponds to about 10, 60 kBT. So if, uh, here kB is a uh, Boltzmann constant and T is a uh, room temperature. So if you do this calculation, you will find that this number corresponds to 10 to minus 19 joule. So which is much, much smaller than the existing power consumption associated with spin 20 device, also much smaller uh, than the existing power consumption associated with transistors. Uh, so of course, another uh, clue, another uh, conclusion that, that we can get from this analysis is that uh, in principle, in practice, it's quite likely we will not be able to realize this kind of energy barrier 10 to 19 joule, uh, minus 19 joule energy barrier with just a single spin. So because for a single spin, if you utilize a practical magnetic field, uh, B, and they multiply its bar magneton, you'll find that this energy is roughly in the time, is energy scale of about 10 to minus 23rd joule, uh, so which is much smaller than this uh, energy barrier that we need. So that means we need probably an ensemble of spins to make sure that they work together, so they couple together to form a nanomagnet, uh, so, and then to support this energy stability. Uh, so roughly, this corresponds to about 10 to the fourth electron. So that means we need a magnet which is, has a nanometer size uh, in both its uh, lateral dimension, in all of its lateral dimensions, to realize this uh, finite energy barrier. So this is a rough estimate of the energy consumption. So and also we can ask what gives the fundamental limit for operating speed of spin twenty device. So uh, actually, the for magnetic device. Their operating speed is governed by their intrinsic uh, operating, uh, operating uh, intrinsic magnetic dynamic frequencies. So usually for magnetic material, we know there is such kind of ferromagnetic relative frequency. Uh, so usually for realistic uh, internal magnetic field, or we call it an absorbed field. So basically, which is about 0.1 to 1 tesla, we get uh, fMR or Ferromagnetic relative frequency, which is about gigahertz. So if you convert uh, from frequency domain to time domain, you will find that this corresponds to a few nanosecond or about one nanosecond switching time. So the reason that it's uh, really a few nanosecond or even more than 10 nanoseconds for switch the nanomagnet is because in order to get switched, usually uh, the magnetic moment needs to undergo a few periods of those kind of uh, magnetic precession. Uh, so just as shown by this red or blue, uh, green curve uh, in this figure. Okay, so now we have a rough understanding about the fundamental limits on the op energy operation and also on the operating speed. In the following, I would like to talk about some uh, materials that we studied recently uh, to show there that how we can potentially 
overcome uh, the difficulties in writing energy and also in the uh, writing speed for uh, magnetic device. For the first part, I will talk about how to realize magnetic reading and writing with a special type of magnet which has zero total moment. Okay, so uh, basically for magnetic switching, uh, just as I mentioned earlier, so the uh, operating speed is mostly limited by its uh, fundamental uh, precession frequency. Uh, so for ferromagnetic material, it's where this frequency is given by this formula, which is known as Kittel formula. And you can calculate using a standard, uh, some typical authority field. You will find that uh, where this frequency is a few gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. And we also know that there is uh, another type of magnetic material, which is known as antiferromagnet. In antiferromagnet, unlike ferromagnet, where all of the spins uh, couples parallel with each other, in antiferromagnet, you have spins which uh, couple anti parallel with, with each other. So, in this kind of anti ferromagnet, you will find that its readiness frequency is much, much higher than the ferromagnet because of the internal exchange field between the two sublattices. So, usually, this effective exchange field between the two sublattices can be as high as a few hundred or even uh, 1000 Tesla. So, now if you go through the mathematics, you will find that this readiness frequency. Uh, can be as high as terahertz or a few hundred gigahertz. So now you can potentially uh, realize magnetic switching on the picosecond uh, time scale. So that's a rough estimate people make uh, to justify the, search, the research towards the direction of anti Um Of course, anti ferromagnet, as I said, it has this kind of advantage of fast dynamics. In the meantime, it also has additional advantages that there is no speed. Imagine if you have a ferromagnet uh, because of the finite magnetic moment. So uh, surrounding this ferromagnet, there will be a fringe field, or sometimes we call it street field, which can influence its neighbors. Uh, so for anti-ferromagnet, because all of the moment is compensating internally, so there is no net moment. So that means there is no street field. So you can place two bits very close to each other and without worrying that they will influence each other. So uh, potentially you can get a much higher density. Also, uh, uh, because there is no street field, you can easily, uh, you cannot easily decode the information stored inside those materials. So people sometimes say you can also get better security. However, the disadvantage associated with anti ferromagnet material is also very obvious. Uh, one significant issue associated with anti ferromagnet is that there is no easy way to read and write information into the antiferromagnet. First of all, for ferromagnet, we know the simplest way to control its orientation is just simply apply uh, external magnetic field. However, for antiferromagnet, because there is no uh, net moment, so if you apply an external field, you'll find the effect exerted onto the two sublattices will cancel out to each other. So there is no response to external field. Uh, secondly, uh, it's also very difficult to read the information out uh, because the two sublattices cancel out to each other in terms of the net magnetic moment. Uh, it's not very easy to define two different states. Uh, so maybe you can define one state at basically the moment the spins uh, located in uh, side A point up and side B point down as state one, and side A point down and side B point up as state zero. However, those two states only differ by a translational uh, uh, operation. So you just simply uh, shift your uh, lattice by one, sub, uh, one unit cell, or maybe actually smaller than one unit cell, you will get exactly the same state. So uh, there is no uh, efficient reading mechanism that can tell those two different states. Um, despite all those difficulties, actually in the past few years, roughly in the last decade. Actually, people have made some progresses towards uh, efficient reading and writing information from anti Uh So I think one of the uh, early investigation into this topic, one of the pioneering work is done uh, in, the, uh, in the group of the University of uh, Texas at Austin. So basically, this shows that in a bilayer structure, which is ferromagnet and anti ferromagnet bilayer structure, and between the ferromagnet and antiferromagnet, there is exchange bars uh, due to the exchange interactions interface. 
what we found is that we apply current through this uh, bilayer structure, actually, from top to bottom. Uh, you will change the exchange bias between those two layers. So when the electrons go from ferromagnet layer to anti-ferromagnet layer, you will find that actually the exchange covering will get weaker or get stronger, uh, depending on the electron flow direction. So this is some initial work uh, toward this direction. Uh, and most recently, uh, for example, last year, we were demonstrated that by utilizing a special uh, anti ferromagnet with special lattice symmetry, inside this material, there is some uh, local uh, breaking uh, inversion symmetry. And they found due to this special lattice symmetry, there can be a non-zero uh, spin orbit interaction-induced torque inside this material. And it happens that the effect has um, effective field on those two sublattices along opposite direction. So that prefers to switch the two sublattices towards opposite direction, uh, which works constructively to switch uh, the overall uh, anti ferromagnetic uh, magnetic ordering uh, parameter. So they show that you can switch by 90 degrees, whenever when the neural when anti ferromagnetic ordering parameter pointing along the horizontal direction, when they apply current, they can switch it uh, along the perpendicular direction, and then uh, they can switch it uh, backward. So this is uh, some very uh, recent results uh, working on the writing information into anti ferromagnetic. At the same time, to read the information from anti ferromagnetic, people have also made some progress. Uh, for example, people show that through the anisotropy magnetic resistance or planet Hall effect, people can tell those two different states uh, where the uh, anti ferromagnetic ordering parameter lies along the current flow direction or lies uh, perpendicular to the current flow direction. Uh, so there will correspond to different uh, anisotropy magnetic resistance. Also, people also study this kind of anisotropy tunnel magnetic resistance. So depending on uh, whether the anti ferromagnetic layer has some couples uh, well with the ferromagnetic layer or form some angle, you will also get some different tunnel magnetic resistance. So uh, so far, people have found some uh, mechanism that can be utilized for to realize magnetic reading and writing in anti ferromagnet uh, although uh, those methods are only restrained to special material systems and also uh, to some very special uh, switching situations for example 90 degree switching instead of 180 degree switch so today what i'm going to talk about is slightly different from those approaches so basically the main difference is instead of using anti ferromagnet which where the magnetic atoms are composed of the same magnetic element, for example, nickel oxide, where all, both of the two sublattices are composed of the same magnetic element, that is nickel. Today I'm going to talk about ferry magnet, where basically there are two different sublattices made from two different atoms. Uh, for example, sublattice one, which has spin up electrons, is contributed from atom one, and sublattice two, which has spin down electrons, is composed of atom two. Uh, so the major difference between those two uh, situations is that now with this ferry magnet, we can still show in the concentration between those two atoms so you can reach a zero moment state. But at the same time, it's possible to define two different states. For example, I can simply define state one as atom one point up and atom two point down, and state zero as atom one point down and atom two point up. So there are very distinct difference between those two states uh, because now atom one and atom two are simply represented by different elements. Uh, so now it's possible to realize a much easier reading and writing mechanism from those uh, material systems. But uh, specifically, how do we realize it? Well, here I would like to remind you about the difference uh, between the Fermi surface property and the Fermi C property. Uh, so from our solid state physics class, we know uh, there are some properties of solid state material that can be attributed to the whole Fermi C, and some properties that can be attributed to the Fermi surface only. So uh, for example, we know magnetic moment. This is a Fermi C property, because if you want to calculate the overall magnetic moment of the uh, material, you need to do the integration of all of the states below the Fermi surface and the spin up state, minor spin down states, and you need to 
e degree all over them. Uh, so besides magnetic moment, we know the electrical polarization is also a Fermi C property, uh, and also uh, many other properties. So at the same time, there are also properties that are only uh, dominated by the Fermi surface density of the states. For example, transport properties. Most of the transport properties are Fermi surface property. For example, if you want to calculate the magneto resistance or specifically tunnel magneto resistance of a certain ferromagnetic material, you will find that this tunnel magneto resistance is proportional uh, to the uh, spin polarization of the two electrodes across the tunnel barrier. And the spin polarization is actually denotes the spin polarization at the Fermi surface. For example, if you want to calculate the uh, spin polarization of certain electrode, it is uh, at the Fermi surface, spin up, this steel states, minus spin down, this steel states, divided by the total, this steel states. So with this understanding of the difference in the Fermi surface property and the Fermi C property, now you can design a system such that under the Fermi surface, you can have zero total magnetic moment. For example, on the right hand side, I have a, spe a specific material. Under the Fermi surface, I can design such that those two uh, subchannel, those two uh, sublattice have total same amount of density, uh, total density of states, uh, total number of states. But at the Fermi surface, there are different uh, spin polarization. Uh, there are finite spin polarization, or there are different density of states at the Fermi surface for spin up and spin down. This is in contrary to the conventional anti ferromagnetic In conventional anti ferromagnetic you have completely symmetric feeling of uh, electrons in the two uh, subchannels, spin up and spin down. And at the Fermi surface, you have zero spin polarization. So this is a major difference between the material that I'm going to talk about today and the anti ferromagnetic material that people uh, discussed uh, earlier. Uh, so at the same time, so this is basically allow us to raise the information out from the uh, uh, this kind of very magnetic system. At the same time, you can also potentially realize efficient magnetic uh, writing, electrically induced magnetic writing, because now imagine if you can inject spin polarized current or spin current into this anti ferromagnetic material or compensated ferry magnetic material. Then the injected spin will uh, exert effective field onto the two sublattices. If you go through the mathematics, you will find that the effective field generated by those injected spin will have opposite side onto those two uh, anti parallel sublattices. And then the effect is basically act constructively to form some uh, final. Torque, which can switch the orientation of those of this anti ferromagnetic coupled system uh, to switch the overall uh, anti ferromagnetic uh, coupling vector. Okay, so uh, more specifically, the material system that we're looking to is a rare earth transition metal alloy. So this system has been known for a very long time. People know that if you have a rare earth 3D, uh, 3D transition metal, if you mix it with a rare earth, 4F rare earth, various elements, you will naturally form some anti-parallel coupled system. So for example, here we started cobalt terbium. Cobalt is 3D transition metal, and terbium is a rare earth element. And when we form an alloy, you will find that actually they uh, couple anti-parallel with each other. And what we can do is we can also tune the concentration between those two uh, elements. For example, when we have a very small amount of uh, rare earth element, terbium, inside this alloy, uh, then the overall magnetic moment is large and is dominated by uh, the cobalt. And when we increase the uh, rare earth concentration, we will find that we can reach such kind of state where the total moment is zero. When we further increase the amount of uh, rare earth dopant, we can find that actually now the overall magnetic moment can be dominated by terbium, and then you get finite magnetic moment again. So basically, we uh, deposit a series of, series of samples, and we found that there is one point where the total moment reaches zero. And, and before and up, uh, above this point, actually uh, the magnetic moment is finite. Okay, so now, um, if you look at the transport properties, for example, the uh, Hall resistance, anomalous Hall resistance, or magneto resistance, we will find that actually the transport properties is mostly dominated by cobalt. So the reason is uh, actually for 3D elements, 3D transition metal elements, uh, the 3D band is very close to the Fermi surface, and the 3D band carries the magnet magnetism. For, 
uh, on the contrary, for uh, various elements, for example, for F, there are four F bands, is way below the Fermi surface. And the four F bands also uh, carries a, a magnetic moment. So they only contribute to the total magnetic moment, but does not contribute to the spin polarization or the uh, magneto transport properties much, which is dominated by the Fermi surface property. So now, if we compare the magnetic moments that we measure using a magnetometry uh, setup versus uh, transport property, for example, a normal score effect, we will find that uh, when the magnetic moment goes to zero, actually the normal score resistance does not go to zero. So this indicates that we can still use a uh, normal score resistance to tell uh, which state the system is in whenever whether a cobalt is pointing up or cobalt is pointing down. Uh, so what moreover we patent the device into this kind of hardware structure and utilizing the spin orbit torque, uh, which I will explain in more details later, to switch the magnetic moment. So basically what we found is although the magnetic moment is zero by applying a current inside this uh, kind of heavy metal tantalum, we can switch the orientation of this cobalt turbine layer from cobalt pointing up to cobalt pointing down. Uh, easily, and when we sweep, when we flop uh, the current direction, we can switch the magnetic moment state backwards. So uh, this basically shows us that switching, electrically induced magnetic switching can be realized in samples with almost zero total moment. Uh, at the same time, we can also more quantitatively determine the effect of the spin orbit torque onto such kind of system. Uh, what we found is that actually when the uh, magnetic moment is approaching zero. Actually, the effective field generated from this uh, electrically induced spin orbit torque also get diver become diverging. Actually, this is governed by the conservation of angular momentum. So actually, if it goes through the uh, mathematics, uh, the formula which governs the magnetic dynamics inside this kind of material, we will find that when the total magnetic moment goes to zero, the effective field does become diverging, uh, which is consistent with uh, theory. So what this means is that you can now switch a magnetic system which has almost zero movement as easily as a conventional ferromagnet like a cobalt, like iron. Uh, but at the same time, you have the advantage of zero total movement and potentially you have the advantage of fast dynamics. Uh, so this is a uh, main conclusion that we got from this uh, experiment. So at the same time, I should mention that besides our group, there are a few other groups uh, which study these kind of similar systems. For example, gadolinium cobalt system or a gadolinium a cobalt iron alloy system, and they found uh, similar behaviors. So basically, uh, when the main movement reaches the compensation point, you do have this divergent behavior of the effective field. Uh, so basically, we utilize this kind of rare earth transition metal system uh, for a simple proof of concept demonstration. Uh, but we know, actually, in practice, this kind of system has some uh, many issues. Uh, for example, we know whenever you put rare earths into a magnetic system, you will get very large damping. So this large damping is usually uh, harmful for realizing efficient magnetic switching. Also, uh, because of existing rare earths, usually it's very difficult to do the fabrication because rare earths very easily oxidize uh, with air. So uh, you want to avoid rare earths, using rare earths inside your uh, magnetic system. So currently, we are looking into uh, new systems which does not contain rare earths, but still give us this kind of compensated very, uh, magnetic moment, also uh, this kind of uh, potentially fast magnetic dynamics. So this, that's what we are working on right now. Uh, of course, another aspect that we are working on is to try to demonstrate that there is some speed advantage associated with this kind of system, which has zero or very close to zero magnetic moment. So this is the first part of my talk. Basically, I talk about the usage of compensated ferry magnet, which has zero total moment, which has anti ferromagnetic couples uh, sublattices. Uh, but at the same time, we can still realize efficient magnetic reading and magnetic writing. And in the following, I will talk about the usage of another type of uh, interesting material that can potentially be beneficial for our uh, electrical induced magnetic switching, that is topological usage. So first of all, why do we, why are we interested in topological usage? 
Well, this is related to uh, one effect that we studied a few years ago. Uh, this effect is known as spin hole effect. So uh, spin hole effect, you can understand it just like a, as a spin version of regular hole effect. You know, in regular hole effect, if you apply a current uh, longitudinally, you will find get a positive and negative charge uh, accumulated on these surfaces uh, because of Lorentz force. Actually, uh, because of the uh, spin orbit interaction, recently people discovered that there is also this kind of spin version of Hall effect that is due to the intrinsic uh, spin orbit interaction of a solid material. When you apply a current longitudinally inside this material, you will find that spin up and spin down, electrons will get deflected towards different surfaces and accumulate at all these surfaces. So uh, roughly, the spin current direction is given by this uh, charge current direction cross product uh, and it's cross product with this uh, spin orientation. So using your right hand, you can roughly de determine towards which direction those spins will get deflected and accumulated there. So this is roughly the spin hole effect. Uh, so previously, um, I, uh, we demonstrated that using the spin hole effect or using the spin orbit interaction, you can reduce such kind of uh, torque, which can ut be utilized to switch the magnetic moment. For example, we uh, apply current inside this tantalum and utilizing the spin hole effect inside tantalum, we can switch the orientation of a uh, free magnetic layer uh, inside a uh, magnetic tower junction that is in adjacent to this uh, tantalum uh, spin hole effect material. When we apply positive current, we can switch it from uh, parallel orientation to anti parallel orientation and we switch it back. We can, uh, when we apply negative current, we can switch it back. So uh, this kind of spin orbit torque. Uh, can be utilized to get a very efficient magnetic switching. Uh, and we know the efficiency is finally determined by the, this material. Uh, it's an intrinsic property of the material. So people try to ask what material will give you the largest effect. Uh, for example, uh, here we can make an analogy with a standard Hall effect. We know if you want to find a very strong version of the Hall effect, you probably need to go to the quantum, version, uh, quantum regime. So we know in the classical picture, we have this kind of diffusive Hall effect. But if you go to the quantum regime, uh, instead of get a slight deflection towards sideways, whenever the carrier goes into this quantum core system, it gets deflected uh, sideways and just follow the, uh, the, the, the edge. So you get this kind of edge state. So this is kind of uh, extreme version of the regular diffusive Hall effect. Similarly, for spin Hall effects, there is also this kind of relationship. So if you go to the extreme version, or get to go to the quantum regime, you'll find that instead of going forward, you can get slightly deflected. The positive, uh, sorry, the spin up and spin down electrons will get, uh, will try to follow the edge states and get deflected almost like a 90 degrees angle. So actually, if you go from the 2D system to the 3D system, you will get this kind of covariance rate. Really, people uh, study the 3D quantum spin hole effect. Uh, in, in this kind of covariance insulation system. Instead of getting this kind of uh, edge state, you, get, you will get this kind of surface state. Inside the bulk, you will get insulating bulk, but uh, most of the electrons will just flow uh, at the surface. So uh, and for those surface states, you will have this kind of spin moment locking. So that means for electrons moving towards one direction, their spin is uniquely determined. So now you can imagine if you apply a charge current through this kind of torrent insulator. Because all of the electrons just move on the surface, then you will get a spin, finite spin polarization at those surface states. And by utilizing those kind of cumulative spin, you can try to uh, influence the magnetic, magnetic dynamics of adjacent ferromagnetic layer. So previously, we tried to quantify the effective spin horror angle using the uh, torrent insulator whenever we make this kind of structure. So on the bottom is a torrent insulator. And then we build this kind of um, tunnel junction. So basically, we have an oxide tunnel barrier, which is in direct contact with the insulator. And then we have this kind of uh, ferromagnet electrode on further top. Uh, so we can now apply a ch charge current along the surface of this tower insulator. Due to the accumulated spin, actually, you will detect a finite charge voltage across this uh, tunnel barrier due to the, uh, because of the uh, chemical potential need to match across this uh, oxide barrier. So now we can convert this accumulation of spin current into a finite charge voltage. Uh, so actually utilizing this kind of technique, 
we measure the uh, spin accumulation or the effective spin triangle inside the copper insulator, like bismuth selenide and the humidity bismuth calorite. So uh, the effective spin triangle is listed here, which quantifies the magnitude of the, uh, the uh, spin hole effect. And then we, never, uh, we get this kind of uh, signal, and we uh, obtain through some mathematics, we can convert that into a effective uh, spin hole angle. What we found is that this kind of effective spin hole angle is orders magnitude stronger than other heavy metals that we studied earlier, for example, for platinum or tantalum. Uh, their spin hole angle, effective spin hole angle is roughly, let's say, 0.1, or maybe uh, even below than 0.1. Now, if you talk about um, copper insulators like a bismuth selenide or bismuth and humidity telluride, you will find that those are orders magnitude larger than those heavy metals. So basically, the calculation is very simple. If you want to get a very strong spin hole torque or very strong spin hole effect, you should focus on those materials, copper insulators topological insulators. So earlier, people have looked into the possibility of utilizing topological insulator to uh, control the dynamics of uh, magnetic system that is in uh, contact with those topological insulators. For example, a few years ago, uh, in UCLA, uh, Professor Wang's group, they found that uh, when you can, by applying current inside the topological insulator, uh, bismuth and humidity telluride, tel tel you can uh, switch the orientation of a uh, magnetically doped uh, copper insulator, that is chromium, bismuth, and humidity telluride. So you can get magnetic switching. And more recently, uh, the Tokyo group, also a uh, Tokyo University group, also demonstrated that you can realize switching in this kind of magnetically doped copper insulator. But my problem with this system is that this magnetic material has very low curing temperature, only, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 Kelvin. So it does not work at room temperature. So, uh, so far, people have only demonstrated switching at 2 Kelvin or, uh, or 4 Kelvin. Uh, there is an additional data point, which is done at room temperature from Cornell University. Uh, however, they show that uh, this, uh, they demonstrated the spin torque FMR. So basically, they show that uh, the spin accumulation from this copper insulator can induce a magnetic precession of this top of the of the magnetic moment in this top magnetic layer, which is chromoly, equal iron alloy. Mm -hmm. But they didn't show the uh, full magnetic switching. So a room temperature practical magnetic switching is still uh, remains to be uh, demonstrated. So in this work, basically we show that we can realize this kind of magnetic switching at room temperature uh, very uh, efficiently. So basically the material system we utilize is bismuth selenide, which is growing by the uh, professor. Uh, Samas group at, at Penn State uh, using uh, molecular beam map taxi. And then we uh, receive this material. And after we evaporate, uh, remove the capping layer on top of this uh, bismuth selenide, we put down this uh, cobalt terbium uh, fer ferrimagnetic electrode. And then uh, we verify that you can get a uh, finite magnetic movement from this uh, ferrimagnetic electrode. And it happens that this very many electrode has uh, uh, perpendicular absorbed. So previously, people tried to switch perpendicular magnetized film using the topo insulator at room temperature. But one difficulty they uh, mm. always encounter is that you cannot very easily get a perpendicular magnetized film because most of the system that people studied earlier has this kind of interfacial perpendicular absorbed. But we know from cobalt terbium, uh, the absorbed is actually the bulk absorbed, so you can get a much easier perpendicular absorbing from this system. So now we can grow magnetic insulator, uh, sorry, magnetic electrode on top of a uh, topmore insulator. So next is to show that we can realize magnetic switching. So basically, we again, we pass in the film into this kind of power bar structure and by monitoring the anomalous power resistance uh, so we can uh, detect whether the magnetic moment is switched or not. First of all, we can do a field in your switching. So the y-axis is a normal force resistance, and the x-axis is a applied field along the perpendicular direction. You can see that there are two distinct states, which correspond to cobalt pointing up and cobalt selenium pointing down. As for, uh, and follow, uh, following this uh, field in your switching, we can now apply a DC current through this uh, longitudinal channel and monitor the 
uh, normal source resistance, what we found that with this applied uh, longitudinal charge current, we can also switch the magnetic system between these two opposite states, uh, cobalt pointing up and cobalt pointing down. So basically, this is the first experimental demonstration that at room temperature, the total insulator can still provide robust magnetic switching by applying a current in its, uh, in, in its surface state. Uh, so actually, this is uh, just a rough, uh, sh this just show you that you can realize magnetic switching. Of course, from the uh, switching current density, you can al already get some initial uh, indication that this is a very efficient switching because uh, switching current density is in the low 10 to the 6 amperes per centimeter uh, square range, which is much smaller than regular uh, switching that people realize using uh, heavy metals, which is usually in the 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 ampere per centimeter square range. But of course, to get an even more precise determination, we need to utilize this kind of uh, special technique, which is to monitor the shifting of hysteresis uh, loop uh, under the applied current to show, uh, to come to calculate the effective uh, magnetic field generated by the current. So I will not go through the details, uh, just to uh, let you know. By, after going through this kind of technique, we can uh, determine uh, the effective spin angle of this covering insulator. And it's, we found that it's much larger than heavy metals, about order magnitude larger than heavy metals. But of course, one question that people uh, usually ask is, in this kind of covering insulator, uh, we know it's not real insulating. Uh, the, the bulk is not really insulating at room temperature. There are some bulk state contribution. So people always ask, uh, is the bulk state or the surface state makes a major contribution? Uh, to answer this question, we compare two different materials. One is bismuth selenide, the bismuth and tellurite. So the difference between those two uh, power insulator uh, is that for bismuth selenide, particularly at room temperature, you know there is a huge contribution from the bulk states, while at bismuth and tellurite, the bulk contribution is much weaker. So, and this is uh, demonstrated by the RPARS experiment, which also uh, consistent with our transport measurement, because we show that this bismuth and tellurite has much larger resistivity because of the uh, reduction in the carrier number in the bulk states. Now, we uh, compare the uh, effect, the spin orbit torque effect from those two materials. What we, find that, what we find is that if we use the uh, effective swing horn angle as a, a comparison matrix, we, what we found is that the bismuth and tellurite has much larger uh, swing horn angle compared with uh, bismuth selenide. So this indicates that in a material which has more surface contribution, you get a larger uh, effective swing horn angle, a larger uh, swing orbit torque effect. So this suggests that it's the surface states rather than the bulk states which play the dominant role in providing this kind of uh, spin orbit torque or providing this kind of effective spin horn effect. Okay, uh, in, the uh, in the following, we can make a comparison in terms of spin horn angle between the topo insulator and spin horn effect metals, like platinum tantalum versus bismuth uh, and bismuth and timid tenorite. As I mentioned, there is almost one order magnitude improvement in terms of effective spin horn angle uh, when you utilize topological insulators. The one concern that people usually have is that although it has a larger effective spin horn angle, that means you can use a smaller current to switch the same amount of magnetic moment. However, copper insulator usually has a larger resistivity. So that means uh, it's more resistive. So uh, it's still unclear whether you will really get any energy advantage. However, now we can also uh, take into account both the current and the resistance. So now we can plot the power consumption for those different materials. When, we, when they switch the same amount of magnetic material, what we find is that copper insulator is still much better compared with heavy metals. So we still get almost one order magnitude improvement in the power consumption when you utilize uh, copper insulator. So that's basically uh, all I would like to talk about today. So to summarize, today I talk about two different material systems that we can utilize to realize uh, better electrically induced magnetic switching. One is a zero moment magnetic system that is compensated ferromagnet. So for compensated ferromagnet, it has advantage of antiferromagnet because it has zero moment and it can potentially reach a fast dynamics. 
but at the same time, it also allows you to realize easy reading and writing operation because it has non-zero spin polarization at the Fermi surface. Uh, so experimentally, we demonstrated magnetic switching and magnetic de detection at a point very close to the transition point in a various transition metal ferry magnetic system. And the second material system that I discussed is this uh, topological, topological insulator. What I showed is that you can realize a uh, room temperature topology, uh, switching with topological insulator and this uh, ferry magnetic system. And compared with heavy metals, topological insulator has uh, both current and their energy advantages for magnetic switching. So potentially, it can reduce the power consumption for spintronic devices. So in the end, I, will, I would like to acknowledge the uh, 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 support uh, from uh, ASF and RC, SRC. The work that I presented today is partly supported by those two uh, funding agencies. Also, the material is uh, supported through Spine. the program of the CDCC program. Uh, okay, with this, I would like to uh, conclude my talk, and thank you for your attention. Uh, Lu Chao, we have a couple of questions online. Um, number one, is there any data on the ferromagnetic resonance frequency of the rare earth FM alloy system versus composition? This question was asked right around slide 23. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. So actually, uh, in our, we didn't measure the uh, FMR frequency of this specific material, uh, but there are experimental data points which studied, uh, or basically which studied the rare earth transition metal uh, alloy uh, FMR frequency. So uh, you can get, uh, let's say, a few tens gigahertz, usually much larger than the regular ferromagnetic uh, material uh, FMR frequency. So uh, there are papers uh, studying this. So I would suggest that uh, the person who asks this question can look it up online and he will find the, he or she will find the, the, the paper which study this. A second question online, um, <coughs> does COTB film on top of bismuth selenide have perpendicular or in-plane easy access? Well, this one has a perpendicular uh, easy access. So uh, basically that's the one one of the major advantages associated with uh, this kind of rare earth transition, transition metal alloy uh, in practice, uh, where you can, very, you can get very easy perpendicular entropy um, when you grow it on, on, on top of almost anything. Uh, because we know for current spin orbital study, usually you prefer a perpendicular to plane uh, magnet because uh, it's very easy to show the magnetic switching. Uh, so we found that we can get PMA. Very, very easily out of this alloy. We grow it on top of our Thanks. Okay, any questions here on site? Back room? Yes. Yeah. Right. So how about magnetic field? Like, by the way, I'm going to the air time. You speak up to the top. Okay, so how far, how far is the spin, spin how it back like switching? How far is it? How fast is the spin Hall effect on switching? How fast is the spin Hall effect switching? Well, in principle, the uh, using spin Hall effect using topolysator does not help you to uh, improve the switching speed. So it will be similar to the conventional two-terminal uh, magnetic tunnel junction. So it's still in the nanosecond or ten, tens of nanosecond range. Uh, so, but of course, when you combine it with uh, anti magnet uh, for example, or anti fermagnetic copper system like a thermal turbine, then potentially you can reach a faster speed. Uh, so, but so far we haven't uh, looked into the switching speed yet. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, because I was just wondering if that the, the top logical insulator are more resistive, is it slower than the traditional one? No, I'm not sure. Kevin, can you repeat the question? Uh, just come on up here to the front. The speakers. Are oh, yeah, I'm just it. curious. Come like, up here. Up here. We can hear you better up here. So I was curious. You said this this material is more resistive. Uh, this blood insulator compared to traditional metal. And if it has effect on switching speed, does it? 
So you are asking whether this one is, uh, since it's very resistive, right? yes, it's very much resistive in the metal electrodes that we utilize. So does that influence uh, uh, switching speed? Yes. Well, yes, so we are in a circuit perspective. Uh, basically, the, because you will have effective resistance, you have effective capacitance, basically the time scale that determines how fast you can charge up a circuit is given by RC product, right? So that gives you the uh, time scale. So if it's very resistive, sure, it will uh, be difficult to uh, sweep, uh, to, 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 to improve the speed performance. But of course, it also depends on how much current or how much charge you really need in the end, because if you only need a very small amount of charge, then potentially uh, you don't need a long time to charge it up. So uh, uh, my, well, I think this involves some circuit design uh, issues. So I'm, I'm not quite sure if I have an answer to you. Uh, but even the, in a very resistive case, this resistance compared with a transistor resistor resistance is still much smaller. So I think it's uh, it should be okay. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you. So, Rochelle, so you showed uh, the uh, in the anti-ferromagnet, the spin is able to flip much faster. Is there a, a good physical picture to understand how that happens? Uh, sure. So, uh, well, actually, I didn't include this uh, this, this 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 figure in these slides, but. Uh, well, the, the, the main point is, well, of course, we can roughly understand since it has a faster main, uh, FMR frequency, anti main FMR frequency, then basically the dynamics is faster. But of course, more uh, rigorously speaking, uh, actually, if you talk about spin transfer torque or spin orbit torque switching, in the end, it's governed by the uh, angular uh, conservation of angular momentum. So uh, when you talk about conservation of angular momentum, that means in order to switch this magnetic system with a certain amount of angular momentum, you need to transfer at least the same amount of angular momentum, which is carried by the spin current into the system in order to switch it. So that's the reason why uh, we, if you want to switch regular ferromagnets very fast, it's difficult to do because you still need to transfer this amount of total spin current into the system to co compete with the original uh, angular momentum. But now if you have a system that does not have any angular momentum, zero total angular momentum, then you, in principle, you do not need to transfer any spin, any spin angular momentum into the system in order to reach this switching. So uh, that's, you can very rigorously actually make the argument that a system with low MS or zero MS does have advantage in terms of switching speed. We have time for one last question here in the room. I don't see any more online. Does anybody else have a question? If not, let's thank Lu Chao Lu one more time. Our next webinar will be on January 30th of 2018. Next semester will be the last Tuesday of each month.